webinar. I'd firstly like to acknowledge um, the traditional custodians on the land in which we live and work and that sovereignty has never been ceded. Um, thank you for joining us. Tonight's webinar is about facilitating community participation through governance structures. And it's the third webinar in a series of four that has been designed for community energy groups who are keen to learn about and ensure strong community participation in their projects. And it has proudly been brought to you by Sustainability Victoria and Community Power Hub. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to our webinar presenter, Dr. Dara Hicks. She is one of the founding members of the Community Power Agency. And the Community Power Agency is a national organisation that is dedicated to supporting communities to take their power back by developing and delivering community-owned clean energy projects. Welcome, Jarrod. We also just quickly have Tom Knuckles on the line, who is another director of the Community Power Agency. Excellent. Thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, there is a typo on the screen there. This is the third webinar of four. Um, thanks particularly for all of you who, um, who have been here for all of them. Um, this week what we're going to be talking through is how we can structure the governance structures, how we can how we can pursue governance structures that help us to have strong participation in our community-owned renewable energy projects. I'll be using, um, particularly through the PowerPoint slides, through the text in the PowerPoint slides, I use an acronym called CORE, which is Community Owned Renewable Energy. Um, so what we'll be talking about tonight is all different ways that um, you can structure governance. And we'll be talking about legal structure as a very key and fundamental part of governance but also how governance is delivered through other means, through other formalised means, such as policies and procedures and audits and certifications. So they're, they're formalised, they have some legal standing, but they go beyond um, and in different ways. They help us perform and create our projects in different ways than the legal structure does. And then we'll also touch more briefly on um, informal aspects of governance as well things to do with the culture of our organisation um, and the things that maybe are held as values in the organisation but aren't necessarily embedded within the formal governance structures. So this builds on the content from the previous two weeks. Um, in the first week I gave an overview about um, participation and the nature of participation within community energy projects. And last week we, we spoke about economic arrangements and the many diverse economic arrangements that can be pursued to deliver community energy projects and what the different ramifications are of different choices on either facilitating or restricting participation. So tonight, um, tonight I'll be drawing, um, it'll be much the same format as the past two weeks. I'll give a brief recap of the content today I'll talk about um, what I mean by governance structures um, and a bit of the, the sort of the general um, different types of governance structures and the general knowledge. Um, sorry, I'll go to this one here. Yeah, that's what I want. Um, yeah, so we'll talk about different legal structure options and we'll talk about different extra legal structure options. So different options beyond your legal structure that are extra to your legal structure. Um, and then after that, we'll go up and talk through different case study examples of different ways that um, that projects, community energy projects, have structured their constitution, their policies, their membership, their voting and quorum arrangements, and their rules around surplus dis distribution, and what this has meant for participation, for community participation in those projects. Um, at three points throughout tonight, we'll break for question and answer. Um, and after the, the second topic, we'll also have a short five minute break just so that people can um, you know, have a bit of a stretch and, and then come back to it. So that's the plan for the night. Um, and we'll close just with talking about what's next. Um, 
with, with the, the next webinar, but also the fact that there are some other workshops in this series that are being um, sponsored by, by Sustainability Victoria and the Community Power Hub. So, just to very quickly, Sorry, oh, yeah. I'm just going to jump in. Just people to make sure that you're asking questions in the Q&A panel. Um, it should be at the bottom of your Zoom window and just get yourselves familiar with that. Thank you. Yeah, so you can ask a question at any point. Um, we're going to answer questions um, at the, that, that those three allocated times throughout the program. Um, and Tom and Ella will be helping to, to curate the questions and, and also jump in with answers where they have something to contribute to. So um, we'll be treating it a little bit more like a panel, which um, might help break up the one way talking, which can get, you know, not my preferred model of delivery, but, we'll, you know, that's what we've got for tonight, so we'll go with it. So apologies for those of you for whom this is. Um, repetition, but just to make sure we're all up to speed um, with the content, I just want to give a quick recap. So a lot of what motivates us to pursue community-owned renewable energy are a whole range of, of different values and, and different, um, a different vision for the future. Um, we want to achieve environmental outcomes as well as social and economic and political and technical outcomes. So this diagram just shows the diversity of motivations that lead people to pursue community energy projects. And ideally, through the process of setting their projects up, they're able to deliver those motivations as outcomes. Um, and it's particularly those social outcomes that are represented in the, um, the orange oval that are really heavily influenced by participation. Um, it is people's participation in community energy projects that helps to deliver things like empowerment and skills development, um, that helps to really connect with people's hearts and minds and increase their level of support and understanding for renewable energy, to increase their propensity to, to, um, to act on environmental issues and to build connections with other people in their community and um, to build that, that real sense of um, community cohesion and local ownership. So all of those social related outcomes are fundamentally grounded in people's participation in the project. <clears throat> so this is particularly important, thinking about participation and thinking about how we structure our projects or our enterprises um, to to accommodate as much participation as possible is important because it helps us to achieve those social outcomes that deliver things such as those on the screen, you know, that sense of empowerment, um, building that, that context of really strong social support that's going to bolster and push and drive um, a rapid transition to renewable energy. Um, it's also that social context that's going to help us achieve the policies we need to drive um, renewable energy. And it delivers things that um, local people's participation is key to delivering local benefits. You know, for example, as we spoke about last week, through local shareholders. When you have local shareholders, then you're helping keep that money local in the local economy. But it's not always um, easy or obvious how you build strong participation in. And as as we recognise, setting up a community energy project. You have to balance a lot of different priorities and a lot of different contexts, you know, um, different challenges associated with your context. So um, sometimes, sometimes things to do with participation get pushed to the side or we forget about them. Or, but this is really about thinking, taking some time to think about how we can better design our projects to build in strong participation. Um, so this phrase I use around enterprise design really just refers to a conscious process of designing your enterprise or your organisation or your business to meet, consciously designing it in a way that's going to meet our, our practical and our ethical requirements. By ethical I mean, you know, those, those things that really motivate us and those values. Um, 
so it's, it's purpose going through a process to really intentionally and purposefully create the different governance structures and the different economic arrangements and the different community engagement practices and the technical features that are going to make a community energy project work. Um, we think about the process of designing a community energy project. Um, we like to re represent it visually in this way where your vision and your values or your motivation feed into these four aspects in the middle. And these four aspects, they're the ones that we're really focusing on in this webinar series, particularly the organisational structure and governance, the community engagement, and the finance and fundraising. Sorry, just one moment. I'm so sorry about that. Um, on the other side of um, the development framework here, we have the context. So obviously, de designing a project involves paying attention to your vision and values, making sure you keep those central, making sure you're designing those in, but also acting within the realities of your context, the constraints and the opportunities that that brings up. So those four features, um, those four aspects in the middle, um, we like to think of them as the building blocks for community energy. So your enterprise as a whole, that's the whole entity. Within that, you have these, these four aspects. Um, Tonight we'll be focusing on the governance structures. Last week we focused on the economic arrangements. Next week we're going to be focusing on the community engagement practices. So um, beneath each aspect, there's a whole bunch of features. And it's really those different features that we'll be talking through tonight, the different features of the governance structure. Um, and as we'll speak through, you know, the different arrangements within your constitution might be a feature. Um, the different um, the way you choose to structure your voting rights, for example, might be a feature. Um, so that's what we'll be focusing on. That I introduced um, this concept of the, the participation footprint, which looks complex at first, but really is quite a simple, it's a simple idea. It's, um, it's a visual way to represent the, the degree of participation that's being designed into a project. Um, so I'll be using these diagrams to, to illustrate how governance structures um, have influenced the way that people participate in the project. So I'll be using them throughout the presentation. Um, so it is quite important for me just to introduce what's going on here. Um, so each of the coloured lines is a different project, a different case study, um, and I'll introduce the case studies in a bit. What you're seeing here is um, there's a range of indicators on the, on around the edge. So each arm of this web represents a different feature um, of the enterprise that relates to or provides some opportunity for participation. Um, uh, that the outside is a stronger level of participation and the inside is a weaker level of participation. So when you map the performance of the different projects, you get what, what I call a participation footprint. So the larger the area encompassed by the coloured line, the more participation has been enabled through the project. Um, and as I said quite a lot last week, the point here isn't um, to make value judgments about what's a better option. It's about making it visible, about making, um, making it visible the influence that different choices have on the degree of participation in our project. So what we, what we want to be able to see here is the difference between different projects or the difference between different options rather than you know, one option necessarily being better than the other. Another thing to note is that the indicators around the outside, these are ones I've developed that related to what I was interested to, to explore within each of the case studies. Um, and they're not hard and fast either. You can adapt those to suit your interests and what you're wanting to explore. All of the features we'll be exploring today, of course, are related to the ways that governance 
helps to it helps to facilitate or restrict participation. Yeah, so as I as I sort of have already explained, I won't go over this much, but the footprint is really just a way of visually mapping how many different opportunities for participation come together um, and what impact that has had overall. So it's that visual representation of how the enterprise design has influenced the ways that people participate. So last week we were focused on economic arrangements. Um, we talked about both monetary, so you know, cash-based, um, and also non-monetary contributions. So um, we looked at both where the money comes from and where the money goes to, and the different sources, the different sources of money, such as donations and grants and investments, and the different options for where the surplus you generate through your project, where that can go to, you know, such as returns to investors and community grant funds. So we also looked at the non-monetary contributions, such as the value to community energy projects in terms of volunteering and in-kind contributions, um, and how it's particularly those, those non-monetary contributions that provide a lot of opportunity for participation um, and help, can help build a lot of connection with, between the project and the community. We talked about a lot of different possible forms of economic participation that people can get involved with in a community energy project. Um, and we talked about things such as um, share offerings and volunteering and gifting and forming partnerships with local businesses um, and, and prioritizing local procurement, for example. So that's, that's the recap. Um, we'll pause at this point for questions. Anybody's got any questions? Joe, nothing's come through in the Q&A panel. We've answered a couple, well, we've answered one question on the fly yep. about whether or not community energy projects, uh, whether we have any in the cities. And my answer to that was that, that they can and do occur anywhere there are people. And in Australia, we've got several projects that have occurred in cities. And by cities, I mean the metropolitan area of the city, not necessarily the CBD. Um, uh, if anybody's got a question, please type it into the Q&A. Um, I, I don't have any. Okay. Well, we might just jump into this week's content then. Um, there will, as I mentioned, there'll be two other spots where you can ask questions. But for now, let's get into talking about governance structure options. Um, the reason why I think governance structure is particularly important for us to look at is because a lot of the things that motivate us to pursue community energy are about rethinking who has power and control, well, power and influence in our energy future, in making decisions about where our energy comes from and what the impact of that energy is. And a lot of our motivations are to do with democratising the energy system and decentralising the energy system. Um, and they, both of, both of those motivations fundamentally require um, governance structures that allow people to participate and to help to keep the power um, and the control over the community energy project in the hands of people who are directly connected with and interested in the project. And, and oftentimes that community of people is very much a geographic focused community but it is also sometimes a community of interest. But nonetheless, it is a group of motivated citizens who share common, a common vision, who want to work together to change the future of how energy is produced. So fundamentally, we need governance structures that help us to deliver that level of accountability and that level of um, involvement in decision making. And I fundamentally see community-owned renewable energy projects as forms of social enterprise. Um, social enterprises are businesses that that trade. They have must. They do. You know, they participate in the market, but they're motivated by social and/or environmental motivations. So they they do this sort of in-between dance between a traditional not-for-profit 
and a traditional um, company or corporate structure. So they trade, they participate in markets, but they're also fundamentally motivated by social and environmental ethics. Um, so our governance structures and our legal structure is a key part of our governance. They provide the structure and the form to keep those those motivations and those values alive in the long term of our project. They help to protect that social and, that, and environmental mission um, in the very fabric of the organisation. So the, the features of governance structure that we're going to talk about tonight, obviously they're not going to be every all of the options you can consider in terms of governance, but they will give you a sense of particularly those um, features of a governance structure that relate to the way that people participate in the project. So I like, in terms of the bigger picture of what we're doing here, um, I really like this quote by Marjorie Kelly where she says, we know that the next economy will require things like wind turbines, limits on carbon emissions and sustainable, sustainably managed forests. The questions that remain largely unanswered are about who will own these, who will control them, and who will flourish in the world they create. So these questions are fundamentally about how do we govern this opportunity that we have now with renewable energy. And what community-owned renewable energy said is people, communities need a central role in governing renewable energy. And we need to benefit from all the opportunities that that can bring. So tonight, that's what we're talking about. So in terms of governance design questions, thinking through your governance structure options includes paying attention to things around your membership, around your board and how your board functions and who's on your board, um, who has voting rights, how decisions are made, who's participating in what types of decisions, your rules around quorum, um, around membership and shareholding, and around surplus distribution. So we, we talked about surplus distribution and this is surplus as in like um, all the money that's left over after you've paid for your cost, which often gets referred to as profit. But um, surplus distribution is an economic aspect, which we spoke about last week, but it's also very linked with, with your governance structure and your legal structure. So we'll be talking about it again tonight. So questions that you think through when you're thinking about governance are, who's going to have ownership of this project? Um, and maybe will different entities own different elements? Who are the desired members? And how many members do we want or need? Who's going to carry the risk and the liability and the responsibility? How are decisions made? Who needs to be involved in what decisions? Um, who gets to vote? Who gets how many votes? Um, and how do we make sure that the things that are really motivating us, that are really important to us, are upheld over time and that they can withstand changes in the market, changes in our membership, um, the fact that your founding, founding leader might move, or move on. Um, and all of these things um, we can do within, within the governance structure. So governance structures, as I alluded to a little earlier, I think of them in, in terms of both formal and informal governance. Within the formal kinds of governance, we have our legal structure, um, different legal structure options such as cooperatives, companies, um, not-for-profit associations. They, they're the most um, legally binding and foundational aspect of our governance. And they define things, they set rules around things like membership, board composition, decision making, um, whether you can issue shares or not, all of those are, are defined in, in your, your legal structure, in your constitution. But there's also other formalized ways of formalizing your governance that go beyond your legal structure. And these are things that I refer to as extra legal because they're in addition to your legal structure. And they're things like policies and procedures, um, agreements, certifications, training programs, anything that sets an intent, some of which are legally binding, 
but some of which are a commitment that you've made to your membership, for example, um, but they're, they're an intent that has been written down and formalised in some way. But then there's also informal aspects of governance. And this includes the, the, the organisational cultures that we develop. And it includes the values that we hold collectively, but also individually. And, and it's often those values that are the, the real drivers behind our participation in community energy projects. <clears throat> so um, in terms of thinking, you know, when you, when you come to thinking about governance, there's a lot of different options that, that you can pursue. Um, this spectrum here, I think, represents um, or uh, brings together some of the really key issues that you need to think through when you're thinking about governance. And they really address those questions of uh, who has ownership and decision-making control and um, you know, who really has power and influence. So um, this spectrum here shows a range of choices from <clears throat> um, from one actor, one vote, or one you know one person, one vote, which is a democratic arrangement, such as in cooperatives. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have one actor, or say one shareholder, has all of the votes, um, which is you know the opposite. Um, and in the middle, you have you have choices in between, where, um, you, for example, you can have your level of voting power relates to your level of shareholding, which is common in, this is the norm in company structures. So it, it addresses the issue that people's power and influence should relate to the level of risk that they've taken, the level of investment that they've made in a project. So it's not democratic, but it's related to the, the level of investment of shareholding that they've made. Um, and also sitting somewhere in the middle here is, is different ways of structuring rules around which actors get more or less votes. So um, as I'll speak about in a, in a while, you can have arrangements where um, some members might receive more votes than other types of members. Um, or you might place a limit on the number of shares or the, that, or the number of votes that any single member might have to balance it out a little bit. Um, so that's sort of one of the spectrums that we need to think through when we're thinking about governance structures. And of course, this, this spectrum fundamentally influences the democratic nature of the project and the, the way that people are formally able to participate in the decisions um, in, a, in a community energy project. So when you drill into this spectrum of options, it relates to not only the allocation of voting, but also who's eligible to be a member, who's eligible to be a shareholder, um, how, yeah, how many shares can any individual member own, um, and how many members can participate. And all of those different sub-decisions influence not only how many people can, can participate, but in what ways they participate and, and how much relative power and control they have. Um, compared with other members. So I'll talk a bit about legal structure and different legal structure options. Um, so legal structures regulate a lot of things within our organisations, within our enterprises. Um, things like ownership rights, voting rights, whether it's not-for-profit or for-profit, um, legal liability, uh, so that's the level of individual risk and responsibility that members take on. Um, the way that the board operation works and who's on the board, things to do with share offering or your different fundraising options, um, things to do with asset ownership, tax status, um, your ability to trade, all, all of those things are regulated through legal structures. Um, and of course, different legal structures have different implications on participation. So the main legal structure options available in Australia are incorporated associations, which are a not-for-profit form, various kinds of companies, so private companies and public companies, as well as um, public companies limited by guarantee, which are not 
an are a not for profit form. Um, and then cooperatives, of which there's two kinds, a distributing co-op and a non-distributing co-op, which is a not for profit form. Distributing co-op has the option to distribute surplus to its members, so it's um, that's why it's called a distributing cooperative, um, and a unit trust. There are other forms of trust as well, but for the sake of a community energy project, this is the most common. So this table, I'm not going to speak through in a lot of detail. It goes over two slides, um, and if you're interested in this, you can come back to it in your own time. But what it basically maps out is for the different kinds of legal structure, what is the different features of each kind? So it sort of it visually compares um, different kinds of legal structures. So all um, for example, all of them limit the liability of your members, which is very important. Um, all of them have the ability to set rules around who can be a member or a share shareholder. Um, they have different levels of um, cost and administrative burden. Um, they have different standing in terms of whether they actually are a separate legal entity or separate separate legal body or not. Um, and on this slide, it explores um, the ability to raise capital. Uh, what's not included here is an incorporated association which isn't able to issue capital. Um, raise capital through issuing shares. Um, one of the important differences between the different legal forms that I will mention um, is that while private companies are extremely familiar, like if you go to a lawyer and you ask to set up a, a legal form, they're going to have a private company constitution that they can pull off a shelf and you know they can help you set up a company in no time at all. It's easy, it's um, quite cheap, but it isn't necessarily well suited to the needs of community energy projects. Um, and one of the challenges with this legal form is that um, it has limits both on the number of people who can become members and on the total level of investment that you can raise. Um, and this, while some really great community energy projects have been delivered in this way, and, and Repower Shoalhaven, for example, delivers their projects through setting up, they've set up multiple, what's called a special purpose vehicle using um, a private company for each separate project. But each project is 100 kilowatts. So it's viable to only have 20 members if you're setting up a 100 kilowatt project. If you're setting up a, a larger megawatt scale project, you're gonna need to have more members. And this is where you either have to move to a public company which has much higher levels of administrative burden and cost um, or you move to something like a cooperative. Um, we'll be exploring some of the difference between these different legal structures as we go through the case study examples. Also happy to take questions about it. So in terms of um, the extra legal op options, so the things supplementary to your legal structure, um, you can set up, and you know, most organizations have policies and procedures that um, that define things like their environmental policy or a local purchasing policy. Um, and these are easier to change than your constitution, but they're still formalized. They're still formal commitments that an organization makes. So they're a really good place to, um, to embed the way that you want to deliver your vision and values, including things to do with the way that people participate or the way you interact with the local community, such as yeah, local purchasing policies or the way that your grant fund, um, a grant fund might operate, for example. There's also a bunch of external certifications and some community energy projects are pursuing these. So um, examples are um, the B Corp, the Benefit Corporation certification that you can get. Hepburn Wind is a B Corp. I'll be talking about this a bit more you know, um, when I go through the case study examples. But there's also things like um, the Clean Energy Council accreditation for solar installers. That's another type of external certification. Um, auditing, I would consider an extra legal, legal option. It's a way of um, being accountable to 
your performance. And you can audit things, you can audit your financial statement, but you can also audit your social and environmental performance as well. Um, partnerships and agreements. These are formalised, written down agreements um, for how an organisation will relate to other organisations or other enterprises. So things like Sustainability Victoria's Take Two initiative, that's a commitment to, um, to reducing carbon emissions, for example. Um, and of course, training programs, they're another formalised means through which um, an enterprise can help to um, pass on its culture and its practices um, that will help to um, maintain consistency for the way that governance happens in the organisation. So when we bring this together, there's, there's lots of different potential ways to participate in governance. So there's participation as a member, which is influenced by membership rules um, and, and also lots of other things to do with voting and decision making. Um, people participate as decision makers. People participate as maybe not necessarily in um, formalised decisions, but also in informing the vision and motivations and sort of the strategic direction of a project through through less um, maybe less formal means such as surveys and workshops and forums and and this is sort of where there's a, a hazy line between the formal and the informal governance and um, of a project. People also participate in governance through being involved in management and oversight, so being a board member, being a staff person, being a volunteer um, that helps in governance roles. Right, so this is another spot where we can pause for questions. So the first question we've got here, Jara, is are there any community energy projects that do not participate in the energy market? And if so, is the governance different? Mm. Very interesting question. Um, operationally, the operational management of the projects would be different, and I imagine that would influence the governance in some way. But most, yeah, yeah. So, okay, take a behind the meter, um, a behind the meter solar project such as Repower Shoalhaven. They um, they've established an agreement with a host site, for example, um, the Shoalhaven Bowling Club. And, and Repower Shoalhaven installed 100 kilowatts of solar on the roof of the bowling club. So um, they they are grid connected through the the host site retail agreement, um, but they're not they haven't got a power purchase agreement. So I mean I guess they are still participating in the energy market, but not um, sort of not directly. They're, they're mostly their um, their governance arrangements that relate to what's happening with the electricity is through a power purchase agreement with the host site. Um, there are also um, I'm thinking of the bushlight examples out in in the Northern Territory, where um, communities they're, they're off grid communities and they um, there's solar systems installed solar and battery systems installed alongside diesel generation um, and the governance of, of those projects and is really different because they're, they're remote communities um, that are like through the way that the, the governance of the energy system becomes much more closely linked with how you use electricity because it's a much more obvious and direct connection. Um, when there's only finite amounts of electricity being generated and stored. Um, I don't know, Tom, do you have anything to add to this question or Ella? Um, I, I would start by trying to understand better what is meant by energy market in the question. Are there any 
community energy projects that do not participate in the energy market? And if so, is the governance different? What's meant by energy market in that question? Um, we can take a really broad definition and almost get rid of the energy bit of it and just say, it's, I just said that again, a, a market related to energy. And then it becomes very hard to imagine a project that wouldn't participate in a market. Mm. Um, and I think, I think so for me, it's... Of, so you're going to be trading your electricity or, or, or swapping it. You're going to be, yeah, you're going to be trading electricity in some way, whether that's through the national electricity market or not. Well, no, I didn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say so. Actually, I mean, <clears throat> I've I've pulled up the Coalition for Community Energy's National Community Energy Strategy and the definition of community energy there to help with answering or discuss discussing this question. And I think it's important to remind ourselves that that's really the closest thing we've got to an agreed definition of community energy in Australia. It says that it's uh, the term used to describe the wide range of ways communities can develop, deliver and benefit from sustainable energy and it can involve supply side projects such as renewable energy installations and storage and demand side projects such as community education, mm. energy efficiency and demand management. So we can pluck out some examples and I think uh, probably the original form of community energy in Australia is the solar bulk buy. Now mm. that's not participating in any energy market in any way but it is participating in a market of buying energy Ah, uh, so solar panels. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that's probably arguably missing the point of the question, some point, uh, somewhat, because I think really the question is about <clears throat> is the governance different? Um, and I think you've already covered that, Jara. But you mm -hmm. know, it's de depend guess, depending on what market you're participating in, it might mean your governance, your the legislation that applies to you is very different, and so it, it will have a direct impact on the governance. Mm. But it is also foreseeable, for example, that if you're running a bulk buy program or you're running an energy efficiency program, it may not be necessary for you to have your own legal structure. It may not be ne necessary, it might not be important. Often what trigger, tr triggers setting up a legal structure is the need either to um, own property or the need to to raise finance um, and the desire or the need to limit the liability and risk for its members. So if you're running an energy efficiency education program, you might just be able to be a bunch of interested community citizens and have no need for a legal structure, in which case you'd set up your own government. You'd still have governance, you'd still have ways of making decisions, you'd still have you know, a clear statement of vision or purpose. But yeah, your governance would be different. Mm. And I think you know it's, it's an important point because um, a lot of community energy projects start out just as a bunch of interested citizens, and it's a it's an interesting point that that tipping point where you need to set up a legal structure and what legal structure do you set up, and and your needs change over time. A lot of community energy projects start as not-for-profit associations because that's very familiar, it's easy um, and and it suits the needs when you're first starting out. It's, it's not-for-profit so it allows you to be a community vehicle, it allows you to apply for grants but then you get to a point maybe where you've got your feasibility study and you need to raise capital and so you need members and you need investors or you might need to get a bank loan. Um, and all of a sudden you realise, oh, we need a new, a different legal structure. Our governance needs are changing. And so you might move to a cooperative or a company. Yeah. Sorry, we went a bit off topic there, but interesting nonetheless. <laughs> yeah. The, and the only thing I would add is an off-grid community energy group where it would maybe be like a multiple occupancy um, land ownership where people are able to be off grid and then would create their governance structure to suit. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Um, and um, but we have this. Uh, yeah. No, sorry, you go. Uh, are you adding something more to that? No, no, it's fine. Okay, we have another question. Um, what about participating as a shareholder 
such as in the case of community or employee ownership of a company? Yep, so I'm using, I'm often using the word shareholder and member interchangeably um, because um, any type of legal structure can have a member. So you can be a member of an association, a member of a co-op, a member of a company. If the company allows you to raise capital through issuing shares, those members can then become shareholders. In the case of employee ownership, um, there would be rules around membership that you can only be a member if you're an employee. And then it's those employees, those employee members that own shares. So um, in, in the case of a, a lot of cooperatives and companies, the phrase shareholder and member can be used interchangeably, if that makes sense. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, we also heard another comment, which was there is also another legal form in Australia, the Indigenous Corporation regulated by ORIC. Yep, excellent point. Thanks for raising it. Um, Unfortunately, I have no knowledge and no experience with that form. I'm not aware of any community energy projects that have used it, but I, I would love to know more about that and I would love to see that being used for community energy projects in the future. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's going to be other forms, other legal entity types out there. So one would be obvious to me would be um, what would a local government authority, a council, be, reg uh, be registered as? But I think this Indigenous Corporation, its name is a clue. It's, it's a type of corporate so company, effectively. And I think it has high high relevance for Indigenous communities. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the legal structures that I showcased are the ones that I know are currently being used by community energy projects in Australia. We don't have any more questions, okay, Joan. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Ella. All right. Well, what we might just do at this point, um, where, uh, when did we start? Yeah, we're roughly halfway through the session. So we might just take a five minute break at this point um, and we'll come back and we'll talk through the case study examples. So um, if everybody can be back here at, um, Six. What would that be? Six, yeah, about 53. Six, 55. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. I was giving everyone one extra minute. <laughs> That's 65. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. See you soon. We might get back into it. Are you recording again, Tom? Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So, talking through um, some case studies and examples. I'm going to draw largely on the same four case studies that, that I'm drawing on through the whole series. And that's because these are the four that, um, that I know in great detail, which I studied for my PhD research. And it's my PhD that's informing this whole series. So if you're a sucker for detail and you really want lots of nitty gritty and even more examples, um, you can actually go and read my PhD thesis if you want, um, or at least parts of it. The link is at the end of the webinar. Um, but these four case studies, two from Australia and two from Scotland, all four of them are um, community-owned wind energy projects. That was because at the time that I started my PhD, um, Hepburn Wind and Denmark Community Wind Farm were actually the only operating um, grid exporting community energy projects in Australia. Um, and that was in 2012. Um, so we've come a really long way um, as, as a movement. And uh, there's now many, many more than that. But I also wanted to study projects that had been up and running for a number of years so that we had a sense for um, the long-term outcomes and impacts that were being produced, not only through the setup phase, but also the operation phase of community energy projects. and. Um, because different things happen in different phases and people participate in different ways over time. So all of these projects are um, 
what would be considered larger, or you know, they're all um, 900 kilowatts or over. Most of them are megawatt scale projects, um, but they're delivered in a real variety of ways. So Hepburn Wind, um, as I'm sure many of you are very familiar, is a cooperative has over 2,000 members, most of whom, like over 50% of which are local people. Um, and they funded this 12 odd million dollar project um, largely through, um, well, $9 million, $9 million of the $12 million came from um, investments from their members. Um, Denmark Community Wind Farm is a public company. It has 160 shareholders. Again, more than 50% of those people, those shareholders are local people. Um, and I'll talk through the other features in, in a little bit. Um, Shaffensey Development Trust is over in Orkney in the very north of Scotland. Um, they have one 900 kilowatt turbine. The trust is a company um, limited by guarantee. So it's a not-for-profit company that owns the trust. Um, and 100% of their members are local people, but um, their members are not shareholders, they're, they're just members of, of, of the charity. The Sky Renewables Co-op, again, um, a co-op, and they own a share in a larger corporate development. They own a 12% stake in a um, 27.6 megawatt wind farm on the Isle of Skye. Um, and the cooperative has 200 local members. 200 members, 80% of whom are local. So I'll be drawing on examples from all of these as we go along. I'm also trying to weave in examples from from other Australian case studies, um, and particularly, if I can, examples from um, the community power hubs and what they've been able to achieve. So. Um, there were really important differences across these four projects in terms of the details of um, the way they structure their governance. Um, and it was particularly interesting to see, for example, that, that they're two cooperatives, but how, how those projects bring that to life, bring that legal structure to life, was really different. And Hepburn Wind was able to facilitate a lot more participation than Sky Renewables Cooperative, for example, even though the bones of the, the legal structure um, in both instances provided for a lot of opportunity for participation, it's a lot in the how the extra legal elements and the cultural elements of the project help perform or help, yeah, help bring that participation to life, help bring those opportunities to life. So when we look at the participation footprint for these four projects and um, the features that you see around the edge here, they are only features, this week they're just features that relate to governance. So last week we were looking at the features that related to the way partic people participate through economic arrangements. This week it's just showing the ways that people participate that relate to governance. Some of the features are actually the same though. So you'll see that member finance is there and you'll see that um, surplus going to community-wide benefit are there, and they're um, common. There's overlap between the set of features in each of the the, um, the footprints that I'm using. But this, um, so this week we're looking at uh, a range of features, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to talk through examples that relate to all these features um, in a bit. So I'll keep coming back to this diagram and analysing what it is that's made those participation footprints so different. Um, so first up, thinking about um, constitution. So a constitution is the document that establishes a legal structure. Um, different legal structures require different constitutions that set out and, and codify or really, um, yeah, embody the differences between different forms of legal structure. And they can basically be seen as um, agreements that are entered into by groups of people to govern how they're going to work together. This is a description by a woman called Janelle Orsi from the States who does a lot of thinking about how 
um, how community enterprises govern themselves and set themselves up. And she's fantastic if you if you want to follow her up, Janelle Orsi. Um, so yeah, they're basically the agreements for how people set out the way that they're going to interact through setting up this project, through setting up this enterprise. Um, a lot of what you do when you set up a legal structure, oftentimes people take um, a template legal structure for a company or an association or a co-op and they might adopt most of it or they might choose to make tweaks. And there are, in, in all instances with all legal, legal structures, there's an extent to which you can mould the constitution, to which you can tweak the rules around membership and voting and decision making. Um, but there's also a point at which you're no longer going to fit the definition of what a company is or what a cooperative is. Um, but it is important to remember that you can tweak them and the reasons why you would tweak them is that they're more closely aligned with your values um, and your motivations and more able to help the project deliver what, what the vision is. Um, so a, a really important way really important aspect of keeping that vision and those motivations central to the organisation, the enterprise over time, is through having a objectives or a purpose written in the constitution. Um, having a purpose in the constitution makes it legally binding. It becomes the reason why that legal entity exists and, and that is what the entity needs to deliver. Um, and but a purpose isn't always required. A legal purpose is required for incorporated associations, companies limited by guarantee, and cooperatives. So for not-for-profits, the purpose is all about what makes you a charity. So um, you, you need to have a charitable purpose that relates to a social or environmental mission. In the case of co-ops, um, cooperatives are established to have um, to provide benefits or services to their members um, and so cooperatives will have a purpose as well as um, um, as well as what's called membership active membership provisions um, or yeah so they'll set out not only what the, the purpose of the co-op is but the way that members are going to participate and benefit from being involved in the cooperative um, so, for example, um, Shackensea Trust, they're, they're a not-for-profit company limited by guarantee, and their vision is all about um, regional community development and economic development. And their, their vision, outlined in their constitution, their objectives are all around improving social welfare and the environmental sustainability of the island and island residents. Um, so this includes in their objectives in the constitution that includes reference to providing housing, alleviating poverty, providing education um, and promoting local industry. So it doesn't actually reference renewable energy at all but um, when it having this objective meant that when they set up their um, their community wind turbine, their community wind project, all of the surplus generated through that project goes towards achieving their charitable aims. So all of their income generation goes towards projects that help to increase the, the sustainability and vitality of the, of the island. So that objective is enshrined in their constitution. Um, in Hepburn Wynn's case, for example, their, their mission, which is really about, um, a, it's a desire to take constructive action against climate change and in the process directly benefit the community. So there, um, they really were motivated to do wind development in a different way, in a way that really brings people along and, and involves people. And that was what drove them towards a cooperative structure that enabled a really wide base, like lots of members, really wide base of participation in the community. Um, and in their cooperative, their active membership provisions are all about um, the cooperative helping provide the members with access to sustainable clean energy 
um, and to energy related education. So that's embedded in that purpose is embedded in their constitution. And the constitution is really um, it's the foundation, it's the bedrock, and it's legally binding. Um, so, but for example, on the other side of things, um, Denmark Community Wind Farm, they set up as a public company. Public companies are not required to have a purpose. Um, companies are established, all companies are established with the intent of um, trading to generate profit for shareholders. So that's sort of the essence of what the company structure is generated, uh, established to do. Um, and so there's no need to have a purpose a social or envir environmental purpose in the constitution. And so Denmark Community Wind Farm, for example, doesn't, their, their constitution doesn't reference anything to do with renewable energy or community ownership of renewable energy. Um, of course, they're very committed to that and their membership and their shareholding rules have enabled it, but there's no purpose um, outlined in the constitution. So when you look at um, when you look at this feature up the top at 12 o'clock, um, social and environmental purpose is in the constitution. So they're, they're, they're more than economic motivations are enshrined in the constitution, very strongly for Chassensé, um and quite strong for both Hepburn and Sky, which are cooperatives. But as you can see, um, quite weak there for Denmark. <clears throat> All right. Next example, looking at um, the option of policies and certifications, which are formalised but extra legal government um, governance options. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, these are supplementary and complement the legal structure. But um, while some of them are legally binding, such as you know certain agreements. Um, and audits sometimes, they're not, um, they don't carry as much legal weight or legal requirement as, as the constitution does. But they do play a really important role in um, helping bring the, the values of the organisation alive and help protect them over time. So um, an issue with a lot of community organisations is that they rely heavily on volunteer labour, um, which brings a lot of richness and benefit, but also comes with, um, you know, um, people people can't sustain it forever necessarily and people move on. I mean, in all types of businesses, people move on. And you need ways of, of um, maintaining commitment um, over time, commitment to your motivation over time. And the extra legal agreements are a really good way to do that. So, um, for example, Hepburn Wind has decided to certify themselves as a benefit corporation. Um, a, a B Corp is an external certification that involves um, a yearly report, a type of audit, um, and it's all about um, organisations or enterprises that choose to voluntarily hold themselves to higher levels of accountability around their social and environmental purpose. So it's all about reporting on um, their environmental impact and their, their community and social impact. Um, and because it's an external certification and someone reviews it, um, and it involve, involves yearly reporting, that's a way of building in a level of accountability um, that helps Hepburn Wind maintain the, the centrality of of um, of those social and, and environmental motivations, and some of the things that relate to their B Corp are around their community engagement and their member participation, and the fact that they're a democratic organisation and people, you know, their members are involved in decisions. And um, so, it is a way of certifying some of um, the ways that people that the enterprise creates opportunity for people participate. Um, another example is um, Chaffin Trust and um, the Victorian Community Power Hubs have 
have established local purchasing policies. Um, and these policies encourage the project to, to prioritise um, local contractors and suppliers as much as possible, which not only has a local economic impact, it also builds local relationships and local partnerships um, that of course has an impact on, on the participation footprint as well. Um, another thing that Shackensy Trust has done is, is develop a formal training program for all new staff and volunteers and board members to help um, keep the, the history and the culture alive um, within the project and that, that feeds into um, the way the governance happens and the way people understand their role as people involved in governance in the project. So when you look at the features um, of the footprint that relate to this, it's the um, use of formalised extra legal governance systems. I think that's the only one that relates to this one. So we've got Hepburn Wind um, having used quite quite a number with the B Corp certification, but also they also have local procurement policies. Um, and, and other things as well. Um, Chaplaincy Trust again performing really strong there, and Sky Sky not doing so well in this one. Um, they really haven't um, haven't established any um, that I was aware of that I was able to discover any of these extra legal governance systems. And so in some ways, although their constitution provides for a lot of great stuff. Um, in terms of participation, it's sort of limited in the way that it, um, the way that it was played out in the organisation. Um, next example here is around um, m membership rules. So your membership rules are really important for making decisions about not only who the community of the community energy project is, and often this is, um, you know community energy projects will make a really conscious decision about who the community is that they're seeking to involve and it might be um, you know, a particular geography or a particular demographic or a particular um, interest, community of interest. Um, so your membership, your rules around membership might relate to defining your community. But it's fundamentally about keeping governance in the hands of people who have an active and a living interest in the project and its purpose. And they have an active and a living interest to protect the project and its purpose over time. Um, these are the people who really, you know, they're really connected with the vision of the project and they wanna, they wanna make sure the project achieves what it's trying to achieve. And they're also the people who you want to benefit through the project. Um, and so membership rules are fundamentally about um, setting limits on who can legitimately participate in the organisation. So, for example, um, Hepburn Wind has a policy, it's not in their constitution, but they have a policy of wanting at least 50% of local members. And that um, they have encouraged this not only through having the policy and through making it part of the approval process the board goes, goes through when they receive um, a membership application, but also through the structure of their share offer. As I mentioned last week, they made it um, cheaper, a much lower threshold for locals to, to become members and invest as opposed to non-locals. Um, so that was a way of encouraging and making it more accessible for local people because it was really important to them that local people were the community who maintained ownership and control of the project and to in a, in a cooperative where every member has one vote, keeping decision making in the hands of local people is dependent on having at least 50% or more than 50% of your members being local people. Um, Denmark Community Wind Farm, again, they, they chose to set up as a public company. They knew that to set up a multi-megawatt with farm, they were going to need more shareholders than what was allowed in a private company, which is limited to 20 in one year or 50 over two years. 
Um, so they set up as a public company because they felt that um, it was going to be important to be able to raise a lot of capital. It was going to be able to be important to give shareholders a vote, voting rights that related to their level of shareholding and the level of risk that they were taking on. So they felt for them, the cooperative structure wasn't appropriate. So they went with the company structure, but they put some limits on on membership and on shareholding that made it so that no single shareholder could end up with more than 20% of the shares. So no single shareholder could end up with, um, with a majority of the ownership and decision-making power in the project, and that was really important to them. Um, and on the very other side of things, um, Shack and Sea Trust is a not-for-profit um, company limited by guarantee. Anyone could be, anyone from the island could be a member of the trust for a nominal fee of one pound. So really their, their membership is very, very open as long as you're from the island. But yes, as also very tightly defined um, by geography, um, but no barriers in terms of needing to invest or anything like that. So when you look at, um, when you look at the the feature here at, um, at three o'clock, um, percentage of percentage of local ownership in the project, um, you can see Shap and see hundred percent local people, Hepburn Wind, um, majority local people, Denmark, um, also majority local people, but far fewer people, um, and Sky. Sky, although they had a lot of local people as members in the co-op, in the overall wind farm, um, they were a small percentage of the shareholding of the wind farm. So that's why they're towards the middle there of the participation footprint. Um, because in the overall project, their piece of the pie, the percentage owned by local people was actually very small. So, um, speaking now about how Voting and quorum work and how this interplays with um, membership. So I've already um, talked about some of the implications of the different, you know, one vote per member versus one vote per share. Um, but how this relates to different rules around who participates in what decisions, I think, is, is really interesting. So, um, yeah, the rules around voting and quorum are really what inform the, the formalised decision making um, in our governance structures. So um, in the examples here you can see the difference between, just I've just pulled out two, um, between Hepburn Wind and Chapman Sea Trust. And um, the reason why I think this is interesting is because we're looking particularly, I think what's particularly interesting is at the general meeting. So, you know, annual general meetings in some ways sort of feel a bit like you're going through the motions. But then again, they are the one yearly opportunity where members can put motions and decisions, important decisions do need to be made. Um, and members exert influence over the future of the organisation at annual general meetings. And certain very key important decisions about the nature of the organisation, for example, anything to do with changing the constitution, needs to be made at an annual general meeting. So it's really important to think about what's your threshold of participation for these really important meetings. Um, and for example, um, Hepburn Wind, their quorum at general meetings is based on a percentage of their overall membership number. So, um, you know, if there's 2,000 members, you're going to need more people at general meetings than if you had only 1,000 members. And so their quorum at general meetings at the moment is about, it requires 61 members for, for decisions, for legitimate decisions to be able to be made. Um, and Chaplaincy Trust, on the other hand, although they have a lot of local members, their quorum for general meetings is only 10 people. So um, on the one hand, you don't want to tie your organisation up and not be able to make decisions if you don't have quorum. But on the other hand, um, if you do have higher quorum thresholds for your annual meetings, 
you need to be really proactive in how in getting people there, making sure people are engaged and wanting to come and wanting to participate. And I think this provides impetus over time um, to to keep that happening, to have that culture of participation. Um, so one of the really important and interesting things that showed up was, as I mentioned, the difference between the two cooperatives in um, in in my research. So Sky was a co-op and Hepburn Wind was a co-op as well. But surprisingly, there wasn't always a strong um, relationship between these two features of having democratic voting rights, so a, you know one person, one vote, and local ability to influence decisions in the project. So um, although Although Sky Co-op itself has democratic voting rights, because it only owned a small share in the project, it didn't have it didn't actually have much ability to influence decisions about the project. And also, in addition, because they had very low they had low quorum requirements at their AGM, there was no ongoing requirement for members to participate in decisions, even of the co-op. Um, so this is where that difference, it, it is a lot about how um, it's not only about the legal structure and what's allowed in the legal structure, it's about how it's brought to life. And as I mentioned last week with Chappancy, um, the example of them choosing to finance their project through 90% through debt has meant that they, the bank owns the project and the bank actually makes the decisions about the project until, until Chappancy Trust has paid back the loan, um, then they'll be able to make their, their own decisions again. But until now, big decisions actually have to be vetted by the bank. And on a number of occasions, the banks turn their decisions down. So when we look at the features that relate to voting um, and, and decision making, um, democratic distribution of voting rights and local ability to influence decisions about the wind farm at five and six o'clock. You um, can see that most of the organisations do have democratic voting and so perform really strong on that one, except for Denmark, which, which has put in place some limits on how many, how many votes and how many shares different people can own. Um, but then in terms of the ability for local people to really be involved ongoing in decisions, so through um, decisions that influence the project um, through things like AGMs. Um, you can see really strong in Hepburn, weaker in Chappancy because of the loan, weaker in Denmark um, because of very low quorum requirements at their AGM and at their board meeting, um, and very low in Sky because they only own a small share of the project. Um, I think this is the last example I'm going to talk through, and I realise that we're getting close to time. Um, I just wanted to talk through surplus distribution. So um, in terms of what organisations are allowed to do with their surplus, with their, with their, with their profits, um, this is in not-for-profit organisations, you're not allowed to distribute your surplus to, um, to your members. Your surplus needs to go 100% towards your charitable purpose. Um, and of course, in for-profit structures or in distributing cooperatives, you are allowed to return um, a surplus to to your members or to your shareholders. Um, but it's not as simple as for-profit and not-for-profit. Like in the past, we like to think of these things as sort of pretty black and white, but social enterprise really sits in that, that space in the middle. Um, and a lot of community energy projects com combine the desire and the requirement. If you're going to raise a lot of capital, you need to be able to pay. You know, it will. You you probably won't get that money unless you're able to pay a return to your investors. So that's a pragmatic reality. Um, but a lot of them are able to marry that and and weigh that up with a, a commitment also to directing surplus towards their social and environmental causes and. And, and motivations. Um, and for a lot of core projects, um, this is outlined in the Constitution as a commitment. Um, 
but of course a lot of community energy projects in Australia are quite small so a lot of projects are sort of hundred in the hundred kilowatt range and for a project like that there just isn't the, there isn't the scale of surplus to necessarily think about doing anything beyond um, paying a return to to your member investors and investing in the future of the organization so in, in that, in those cases, just investing in the future of the organisation and its ability to go and do future projects is the social and environmental purpose that they're able to contribute to. Um, but there are also some not-for-profit community energy projects in Australia, so like Chappensea in Scotland, but a great example in Australia is Karenna, um, Citizens Owned Renewable Energy Australia. Um, they have a fantastic revolving zero interest loan fund. So they take donations from their members. Those donations go into a, a revolving loan fund that, that um, funds solar and energy efficiency projects on the roof of community organisations. And those organisations pay it back over time. And as the money comes back, it gets loaned out again. Um, so all of their surplus is directed towards their charitable purpose, which is to go and fund new community energy projects. Um, so this, this feature of a governance relates to it's at 11 o'clock and surplus going to community-wide benefit. Um, I'll just leave that there um, and call for questions because I'm aware that we're out of time. Um, yeah, that we don't have any at the moment, unless anyone is okay. madly typing right now. All right, well, I might just read through these concluding thoughts unless either you or Tom have questions. I'm good. No, I'm fine. Okay. I think I've actually already said all this stuff. Um, in essence, it's that your legal structure is really important, it is the foundation, but then again, um, the other extra legal features that you're able to build in help to um, influence the way your motivations and your legal structure comes to life, including influencing the way, the opportunities that people can participate in. Um, and I haven't talked very much about culture and and um, you know, individual values, but but they also play an important role in um, in governance. But for longevity, it's important to try as much as possible to formalise to formalise those things in some way. Um. Uh. Well, yeah, I think that's. It. We have Is there a question. We have a yeah. A question has popped up. It, um, on the surplus distribution slide, is that smaller than 100 kilowatts or smaller but still greater than 100 kilowatt systems? Oh, sorry. I might have used the wrong one. I meant 100 kilowatts or less. Yeah. So just, you know, in those projects, it, it's because the scale is really different from a megawatt project. It's not always possible to consider doing something like um, having a grant fund, for example, which Hepburn Wind and Denmark Community Wind have both been able to do with a portion of their surplus. Well. I've got a question, Jarrah. Um, it's possibly not that related to questions of community participation, but it did come up in my head is, if you're thinking about categorising the legal and mostly that part of your talk was focusing on the constitution, but I think it's about more than the constitution and then the extra legal, where would something like a registered charity fit into that categorisation system that you've where got? Would a, what, sorry? a registered charity. So well, the, ob the obligations to maintain your annual reporting with the regulator for charities. Yes. For example. Um, that's triggered by your constitution. By your by the type of legal structure that you are. Like you don't actually have a choice. If you set up as a, a not for profit, you have to 
no. report to anybody. Oh, no, no, because that's a separate, yeah, you're right, it's a separate yeah. registration. Hmm. Yeah, it's a separate registration that requires you to report to them. Yeah. And I would, I would, I would assume you would categorise that in the in the legal category, not the extra legal. It's not really a policy. Yeah. It, it's no, it's very legally binding. Yeah. It's very legally binding, but it is it is external to it's external, but it's linked to the legal structure. But you can only be a, a registered charity if you are a not for profit with a charitable mm. purpose. I sort of see it as an add on to the legal structure. Yep. Got another question. Um, I might as well read it since I've got the mic. Are there any instances when a legal structure, le legal structure should likely encourage participation, however participation remains very low? Is there a way of diagnosing what's not working? Um, yeah, I, I would think about I, mean, I think personally this is where something like a tool like the participation footprint can be useful because you can think of different features of the organisation um, and you can go through and assess them um, and come up with, with a map of the participation. So you could hopefully it would help you to see the ways that participation is enabled through the legal structure but um, maybe falls down in other ways. Um, and I think a lot of, probably a lot of what you're referring to there, Sally, um, would relate to the way that your community engagement, which we'll be talking about next week, helps to, to channel participation into what is enabled through the governance structure. Um, Yeah, I think, you know, we're talking about, I'm talking about economic arrangements, governance structure, community engagement as separate things, but really they're interrelated. And I think um, a, lot of, a lot of what helps a governance structure come alive um, is that overlap with how you engage your community of members. Mm, um, that's yeah, you're talking. I would try applying the participation footprint and and just having a play with it and maybe changing the indicators if you need to. Sorry, Tom. No, that's right. You were talking about culture. Mm. So it's, you know, you're, you're getting less and less formalised with your constitution, then you're extra legal, then there's the, uh, the, the third category, which is some cultural stuff. I, I, I can imagine a situation where you would have great formalized structures for participation, but you've got a bad culture. Mm. My, my personal observation is that culture in organizations comes from the top. And it's amazing when you can go in and see different, different cultures and then you can identify where it happens is usually mm. leadership. Um, so I, yeah, I think mm. what you were suggesting sounds like a great idea, Jarrah, just you know, use, use the, the participation footprint. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah. Right, well, we might just touch on what's next. Um, we have one week to go, and next week we'll be talking about how we facilitate community participation through our engagement practices. Um, and then all four of the webinars will be available online um, if you want to share them, if you know someone who might be interested or could be useful for. But we also have um, a series of future workshops which are going to be actual workshops where we can see each other and meet each other. <laughs> Won't that be lovely? Um, yeah, so these are these are on the ground at the sustainability office in um, sustainability Victoria office in Melbourne. Um, and there's the dates and the times there for those trainings on community engagement and facilitation on working in partnership. And then the last one there is um, an advice and critical feedback session, session so where you can actually, you can workshop, um, yeah, come and workshop your project or your project ideas or a sticking point or a challenge. Um, and yeah, we'll give you some advice and some critical feedback. 
that session will be run by Nikki Eisen, who is one of the other co-founders of Community Power Agency. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I'll just I'll just add with that the registration for those workshops will be being sent out probably about mid next week. So keep an eye out for that. And you'll send that to everyone who's registered for these as well. Yeah, yeah, and they'll be going out through the um, information will be sent out through Sustainability Victoria's. Um, mailing list as well as the community power agency's mailing list. Great. Yeah. Yep. And the um, the webinars will be available in three locations: C4CE, community power agency, and also the community power hub. Com. Au forward slash videos. So apologies, we haven't had stronger links to those. Um, we will send those out um, when we do those other mail outs. Sure. Lovely. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks for listening. Yeah. Thank you, Tara. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tara.